So again, thank you for being here. And at this point, I will turn it over to Stacy Mitchell, co-director for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, leading writer, speaker, and advocate in the anti-monopoly movement. Stacy. Thanks so much, Reggie, and, and thanks so much for everyone joining, both the, the journalists on the call today, but also wonderful to have all of the business owners on the call. I know you're uh, taking time out of your busy schedules and doing so really at the last minute, but this is such a crucial issue. Um, small businesses, small independent businesses have been waiting for this moment for a very long time. E-commerce should be a dynamic sector with numerous marketplaces vying to attract both sellers and shoppers. Instead, it's utterly dominated by a single firm. That is not an accident of history. Many years ago, Jeff Bezos set out to establish a corporation that would control the essential infrastructure for modern commerce. Today, Amazon is an all-powerful gatekeeper that sits between businesses and their customers. By controlling access to the market, Amazon can privilege its own products if it chooses. It can spy on businesses, taking their best ideas and their data. It can dictate and rule with just breathtaking disregard. One day it'll award a seller the buy box, the next day it'll suspend its account, uh, wiping out its sales completely. Perhaps nowhere is Amazon's monopoly power more evident than, this, than in the steep fees it has imposed on sellers on its platform, sellers that have no choice but to use Amazon or be locked out of the online market. In the first half of 2023, Amazon took 45 cents of every dollar in sales made by third-party sellers in the U.S. That's up from 35 cents in 2020, just three years ago, and 19 cents in 2014. These exorbitant fees make it nearly impossible for sellers to sustain a viable business online. Most, in fact, fail. In a healthy, competitive market, Amazon's high prices and abusive treatment would lead businesses to go elsewhere. But as the FTC lays out in this suit, Amazon has employed a set of calculated strategies to trap sellers and block their ability to grow their sales on other sites, thereby thwarting competition and preserving its stranglehold over e-commerce. Amazon's monopolization has come at a steep price for all of us. It's squeezed brands and publishers, stunting their ability to develop new products. It's fueled the closure of tens of thousands of independent retailers. And all of this has really cost consumers too, and that's a critical part of this lawsuit today. Amazon's policy against discounting has forced sellers to inflate their prices across the web. Um, Amazon by raising prices, and it's also de degraded its search results. You know, we now go to Amazon and the experience is a bunch of paid listings, fraudulent products, chaos. All of that is because Amazon does not face the discipline of competition. It's also worth noting that many legitimate brick and mortar businesses simply cannot succeed on Amazon's platform, given the fees that it charges. Their choices are to give up access to the online market or to try to make a go of Amazon, but that doesn't really work. And the result is that some of the best and most innovative businesses in this country have been really locked out of, of, of the online market and the future of commerce. Monopolizing a market is illegal and it's an affront to our liberty and democracy. For more than a decade, ILSR has been raising the alarm about Amazon's outsized power and its implications, and we are thrilled to see the FTC file this crucially important lawsuit today. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, Stacy. And next, I'd like to introduce Jason Boyce, a 21-year e-commerce veteran, the founder and CEO of Avenue 7 Media, co-author of The Amazon Jungle, and host of The Day 2 Podcast. Floor is yours, Jason. Thanks, Reggie. And uh, thanks, Stacy. Thanks for inviting me on this panel. Uh, just real quick about my background. I started in e-commerce as a direct-to-consumer seller. My first website was superduperhoops.com. We were drop shipping basketball hoops all over the country. And then Amazon came knocking on our door in 2003 and we became an Amazon seller. And I have to say that first five years was kind of a magical period uh, of, of being able to work with a company who listened to sellers, who drove traffic and who allowed massive opportunities for growth for, for my business. I went on uh, to grow that business to become a top 200 seller over 17 years. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've often said this to Stacy, I, I was kneecapped two or three times along the way and had to pivot. Um, luckily, we survived and we, we made it happen. Uh, but it was it was under very difficult circumstances. Um, over the last five years, 
with the with the ex exception of these last two, um, Amazon really became a closed system. I, I had an exit from my business, I wrote the book and founded um, Avenue 7 Media in order to help brands survive and thrive and navigate on the Amazon channel. Um, and so I've seen not only this from a perspective of a brand and a seller where, you know, today you have a storefront and then tomorrow Amazon puts a brick wall in front of your door and no one can come in to uh, selling hundreds of millions of dollars on the platform and now helping other brands sell tens and hundreds of millions of dollars on the platform as well. And so, as you can imagine, this is a very interesting day. Um, I've kind of known that the FTC case or one of the one of the cases, one of the government agencies was going to file a lawsuit against Amazon at some point, but I'm still a little bit in shock and awe uh, about the fact that it actually happened. Um, you know, from, from my perspective as a seller, I, I think it's important to state that when Amazon started all the way back in 2002 or 2003 with their online marketplace, the reason why they have gained clear market dominance is because they were better than everyone else. Uh, when I started on this channel, we sold on a multitude of uh, other online marketplaces and they just couldn't compete. They couldn't get the traffic. They didn't put the logistics network together. And in many ways, um, I say in some ways I'm sympathetic to Amazon because they are the the antitrust scrutiny that they've received is because they have been a victim of their own success, and um, so I see both sides. Uh, I understand where Stacy is coming from completely, but I also know that Amazon and Shopify and other brands like that have made it possible for an everyday guy or gal to start a brand from nothing. Before those platforms were available, it was very hard prospect. It was very hard to get a gatekeeper who was a human being to put your product on the shelf. And so, um, you know, some of the key elements of today's uh, case are very interesting. I agree with some of them. I also disagree with some, you know, the, the, some of the key elements, anti-discounting measures. We definitely see that what's called buy box suppression day in and day out. Sellers hate it. Um, you know, we require sellers to use FBA up until recently. That was absolutely true. During COVID, you would only, you could only use FBA to get the prime badge. Amazon's changed that now. And I, why have they made some of these changes and why have they opened up? In my opinion, I think it's because of the hard work of advocates like Stacy and some of the folks on this call, speaking out and talking, not maybe not directly to Amazon, but on behalf of the small brands that have also played their part in making Amazon what it is today. So I'm actually excited to see how this plays out. I think it's important for a judge to come in here and hear both sides of the story and see if there's a way forward where sellers can be happier, can be safer, and can have more security in the great business that they've helped Amazon grow. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate that. And next, we want to turn it over to Nicholas Parks, who is president of Snob Foods and 20-year Amazon seller. Nicholas joins us from Birmingham. How are you doing, Nicholas? Hi, good. Thank you, Reggie, and thank you, Stacy, for inviting me. Um, I have sold on Amazon since uh, 2002 um, as a third-party seller, FBM seller at that time. We mainly sell uh, shelf-stable foods, so hot sauces, uh, spice varieties, barbecue sauces, things like that. We ship to Amazon in the U.S., but we also sell FBA in, in Canada and in U.K. and Australia. Uh, we've done this in... Germany in the past. So uh, kind of all over the world at this point, uh, we represent a few brands on Amazon in both the U.S. and some other countries. Um, so the thing that we experience that makes it very difficult is because we're in the grocery category, and this is one of the um, prioritized areas for Amazon in the past few years. I think they're trying to compete with Kroger and um, Walmart specifically. Um, they sell a lot of items at or below cost. They don't assess any advertising or logistics FBA fees to themselves, which of course we as third-party sellers uh, all, all pay that. We spent 46% of revenue on that last year. That doesn't include advertising actually. So I'm sure it was well over 50%. Um, they manipulate the warehouse space in the fourth quarter, which is the most important quarter to all of us where they just usurp a, a huge percentage. In previous years, it's been as much as 75% or so of warehouse space that just gets cut with no notice. I think this year it's going to be 35 or so percent. Um, 
And you just can't compete with that. You can't compete head on uh, in any relevant way in the grocery category. So we have to find items that Amazon doesn't sell. And if they pick up one of the items that we sell, then that effectively means we just can't sell that item any longer. So again, I appreciate the time. I'll turn it back over to you, Reggie. Thank you so much for that, Nicholas. Really appreciate your, hearing your story. And uh, now we're gonna turn to Lindsay Windham and Nate Justice, who are co-founders of Distill Union based in Alabama and sellers on the Amazon marketplace. Lindsay and Nate, it's yours. Hello, hi. Uh, we are an independent brand and we sell our original designs on Amazon as brand registered sellers. Uh, and, and while seller tools have improved since we started about a decade ago, the increasing costs of ads and fees do cut into profitability. And it is hard to swallow that our fees in a way go towards Amazon's lobbying efforts that make it harder for us to remain profitable. Um, I'd like to see brand registered sellers given more control over our product listings, like being able to notate our registered trademarks, which we're not allowed to do. Also, we have no access to consumer information, customers um, information, so we can't follow up to provide customer support, and we can no longer reply to reviews. Um, Amazon has the leverage to shut our listings off, and twice this has had huge consequences for us. Once we got a great press hit that quickly ramped up sales, but the listing was shut off within hours and it took days to get relisted. Another was when our best-selling item was removed during the busiest holiday season. And over a month of trying to get it relisted, we learned that an anonymous competitor had our listing shut down by exploiting a tool that was intended to protect customers. In the process, we had to share our manufacturer's information with Amazon in order to be relisted. Uh, because they've now gotten into the advertising game uh, on their own platform, we can no longer rely on the organic traffic that was once uh, that once allowed the best products to rise to the top. Uh, beyond that, it means that consumers spend more, get lower quality goods, or both, because it's about who can pay for the most ads. Um, when you own both the marketplace and the advertising on that marketplace, there's an opportunity to exploit that uh, to the cost of the consumer and the brands. We've seen. We've seen that cost uh, increase over the years. Um, <clears throat> Currently on our product listing, Amazon is promoting its own impossibly cheap Amazon Essentials option as the quote, similar item to consider and it costs 80% less and it's not similar. And concerning IP, we usually get about six months of exclusivity on new designs uh, before we're copied on the platform. Uh, we we're able to have one copycat taken down in violation of our design patent, uh, but it took multiple attempts. Uh, and with so many copycats, it's it's a time-consuming game of whack-a-mole. Yeah. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Lindsay and Nate. And now I'd like to turn it over to Doug Merdeza, who is a veteran Amazon Marketplace seller through his former company, Top Shelf top shelf brands and is based in Michigan. It's all yours, Doug. Thanks, Reggie. Hey, everyone. Um, top Shelf Brands was a omni-channel um, curator for uh, larger consumer-based uh, brands. We started selling in 2014. We're in, um, to echo Jason's earlier point and, and earlier points of other sellers, uh, fees were much lower. Um, you know, to get the buybacks back then, you you certainly had to have it as an FBA listing. Um, our our strength and our niche was uh, professional beauty products. I was a barber prior to launching Top Shelf, so we saw great margins, great success in that category. Only to have Amazon come along and launch Luxury Beauty, where they essentially gated that product and that brand from any other uh, third-party sellers listing the products. Uh, it was Amazon exclusively that was able to offer those. If you look at the prices to consumer in that category, they, you know, once Amazon takes control of that listing and it's it's theirs and there's no competition, consumer prices tend to raise, raise minimum 50% in that category. Um, and, you know, as we look to pivot from them exploiting that category, it made us go into different categories that were not as profitable, didn't carry the same margins. Our cost structure wasn't able to support that. And it uh, essentially just led to us not being able to stay in business. One of the things that during that pivot, we attempted to do as an omni-channel 
uh, solution was to utilize FBA's multi-channel fulfillment to fulfill orders on other platforms. And we had been selling on eBay since 2014, um, had the best seller badge, everything that eBay, you know, awarded as, you know, being a good seller. Um, we carried those when we pivoted to allowing Amazon to uh, fulfill those orders for us. We no longer were eligible to um, carry that badge just because, uh, you know, they couldn't meet the same shipping times uh, that eBay required. Um, they would they would send the items in, you know, two days, but they would take four days to pick it, thus not meeting eBay, eBay's metrics. So was a very difficult challenge. We, you know, we constantly faced uh, anti-competitive behavior, but uh, we're very happy to see uh, this come today. Thanks, Reggie. Thank you so much, Doug. Really appreciate that. And finally, we have Danny Kane, who is founder of the Raven Bookstore in Kansas and author of How to Resist Amazon and Why. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Reggie. I am not the founder. I am a current co-owner. Um, I have been at the Raven for seven years, though, and throughout my book selling career there, I've seen firsthand how Amazon has huge, overwhelming power in the book industry because they started in books before expanding to everything else. They now represent a large majority of book sales and a near total monopoly of audiobooks and ebooks. There are no parts of my job where I don't have to think about and deal with Amazon's unfair advantages, which they gain through anti-competitive practices like the ones targeted in this lawsuit. From predatorily low prices to shipping speeds that are only possible due to inhumane conditions for warehouse and delivery employees, Amazon casts its shadow over everything the Raven Bookstore team tries to do. We work so hard just to carve out a tiny slice of market share in what was once a healthy, robust, and diverse industry of independent bookstores across the United States. Now we're watching Amazon use these same tactics that secured the dominance of the book industry to secure dominance in retail in general. Uh, so I'm thrilled to see this lawsuit. It is my sincere hope that this lawsuit can stop the bleeding in independent retail and get us closer to a level, level playing field by going after some of the tactics that Amazon used to secure such an unfair advantage. Thanks, Reggie. Sure thing. Thank you, Danny. And Stacy, let's uh, go back to you for some closing thoughts before we go ahead and open open up for questions. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, that was terrific. I, I think one thing I want to just uh, say is that, you know, we talk to a lot of independent businesses and third party sellers every day, you know, not only retailers, but manufacturers that sell to Amazon as vendors. And there are so many more businesses who are under the thumb of Amazon who are experiencing this market power in some cases who've uh, you know, really lost substantial sales or have been unable to sort of invest and grow and are really struggling. But they, so many of them cannot speak out. They fear retaliation from Amazon. Um, and what is so crucial about this case is that it opens the possibility that, you know, businesses will no longer have to live in fear of Amazon, that we will have a competitive market, that not only will consumers have choices about where to shop online, meaningful choices, but so too will sellers and businesses. And that means innovation, it means uh, opportunity. It means no longer living in fear. And, you know, and ultimately it matters, you know, across the country in our communities and to the health of our, our, our local economies. And I think with that, Reggie, if we want to open it up to, to questions, I think that would be terrific. Perfect. Thank you, Stacy. So, yeah, I want to just uh, remind, again, the journalists who were glad who could attend, um, use the raise your hand, raise hand feature in Zoom, and we'll unmute you and allow you to ask your question. And uh, before you ask your question, uh, please state your name and affiliation and then identify the person who the question is directed to if you do have a specific target. And then again, if you need clarification on any statement or you have to leave before we wrap this thing up in the next 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so, um, you can use the Q&A function. And at the end of this, we'll answer as many questions as we can. So with that, I will keep an eye out on uh, questions and panelists. Ariana. Hi, my name is Ariana McLemore. I'm an a Amazon reporter for Reuters. Um, I'm, and this is just more of a general question to the sellers. Um, I'm really curious about like 
if, if these fees stop, like what exactly will that do for your business? Um, especially um, for things like fulfillment services where it can be pretty hard to do those types of things by yourself if you are a small business. Jason, you wanna try taking that one first? I'll mute you, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, Ariana. So the question is, uh, the first part of your question is, what if the fees go away? Um, let's talk about those fees for a second. Amazon, when I first started selling on Amazon in 2003, charged me 15% for every sale that I got. It was a commission-based sale, right? So that's called seller fees, or some people call it a take rate. The second fee is an FBA fee, fulfillment by Amazon. Uh, sellers pay Amazon in order to store, pick, pack, and deliver, have their packages delivered to the Amazon shopper's door. And then the third fee is an advertising expense. And so the way we, and so the advertising expense is to get ad placements mostly on the Amazon platform so that your products can get seen. When I first started, ads didn't exist, FBA didn't exist. When FBA was introduced, it was a miracle. I was terrible at, at, at being a warehouse. We sent our product, not only did, um, did we not run out of stock, but our because of the Prime Badge, our sales grew 30, 40, 50% as a result of that. Um, and then once we got addicted to it, <laughs> that's when the fees started to increase. And so those two fees are logical. A seller doesn't have to pay an FBA fee, but if they don't have the prime badge or they're not doing seller fulfilled prime from their own warehouse, which is a very high bar, they're gonna lose 30 to 40% of the revenue that they could get on the platform because those prime customers shop the prime badge. What's interesting, Ariana, and I'm, 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 I'm kind of getting to your to answer of your question. What's interesting to me is when the ad model started to grow, cost per click is a bidding process. So as many, you know, you know, the bidding, the cost per click goes up for search traffic on Amazon based on the number of competitors driving up that bidding cost. What's interesting about Amazon, in my opinion, is they're both a sales commission model and an ad revenue model. And that's very unusual. I fully expected and hoped as the ad costs started to increase that they would lower the seller take rate. They would lower that seller fee, which they have not done. I think doing that, that fee of all the fees is the most likely that could potentially be reduced. Ariana, I don't think they're going away. Um, potentially, we'll see what um, uh, Ms. Khan has in store for Amazon and what the judge says through this court case, but it's kind of a to be continued. So I, I kind of tried to answer your question, Ariana. I'm not sure I fully did. It's a very complicated one. Oh, I mean, it's a complicated issue. So I completely understand. Yeah. Um, like I've been trying to wrap my head on exactly what the FTC is asking for, because I have heard some sellers say, you know, this will completely ruin my business. Like if the, if the company doesn't have fulfillment, if it doesn't have advertising, they're worried that it will completely ruin their business. But you guys seem to be on the very opposite end of the spectrum saying like, you're really glad that, you know, the FTC is coming down. So I just wanted to hear more about like exactly how the FTC is going to impact your business, whether it's for better or worse, that's all. And then uh, Stacey, yeah, why don't you go ahead and jump in at this point? Yeah, I can add a little bit of, of, of color and background on this that I think is, is useful to know. You know, Amazon's fees, as Jason noted, they've got three major fees. Um, they've got the commission, they've got the advertising fee that they have layered on top, and we should put advertising in quotes because that's not really delivering the value of advertising. In effect, what Amazon has done is convert these pages, the search results pages on its site, a lot of those to paid listings. So in effect, what this is, has been a covert way for Amazon to raise its basic commission, which historically has been 15%. They have now layered these paid product listing costs on top. And if you don't buy advertising, you can't succeed on the platform. It becomes much more difficult because not only do you not get that good space, but because of the way Amazon's algorithm works, search algorithm works, you it indirectly favors sellers that advertise. And so you also lose your place in the organic search. So effectively, Amazon is holding sellers captive and has sharply raised the basic price of just 
listing and selling a product. That's even before you get to fulfillment. That's just listing and selling a product on the site has gone up by 50%, according to a report that we put out last week. Um, we can add a link to that report in the chat in case anyone hasn't seen it. But the thing I want to also step back and talk a little bit about fulfillment by Amazon, because this is a really crucial part of the FTC's case. Um, what the FTC is saying is that Amazon has tied a seller's ability to succeed on its website to using FBA. Um, you know, in order to get that prime badge, you have to use Amazon's fulfillment. You can't make any sales unless you have the prime badge, so you effectively have to use Amazon's fulfillment. There are all kinds of problems with this. And what the FTC is saying, in effect, is that Amazon is, has built this massive fulfillment operation as a way to protect its monopoly in e-commerce. Because sellers get tangled up in the fulfillment, it makes it harder for them to uh, grow their sales on other sites. If you're a seller, one of the biggest things you want to do is diversify away from Amazon. You don't want to be 90% dependent on Amazon. They keep jacking up the fees. They keep uh, taking your data and all of the other things that they're doing. And the natural response is to say, I want to have business elsewhere. Um, and sellers are really impeded by doing that because of FBA. They can't use a neutral shipper that could do both their Amazon and their non-Amazon orders, which would be the best way to grow their business off-site. There are other ways that Amazon in this suit is alleged to, to be impeding sellers' ability to grow, grow their, their sales on, on, on other sites. And I also just want to just a couple of uh, last things and I, uh, is to say that, you know, this idea um, you know, Amazon is going to, you know, based on what they did during the congressional debates over the big tech bills, we can expect them to be out there saying, oh, well, you know, we might have to kick sellers off our platform or we won't be able to offer them our fulfillment services or what have you. And that is absolutely a complete bluff, a total bluff. A third of Amazon's revenue comes from the fees that it charges businesses on its marketplace. This is the cash cow of its business. It is a much bigger cash cow than even AWS. This is the heart of its uh, of its revenue and the heart of its enormous uh, surplus that it's able to take from the economy. Um, what we really hope to see from this case is that Amazon will be blocked from requiring sellers to use its fulfillment. And that's a great thing for everybody because now sellers can use other carriers. They can choose UPS. They can choose the postal service. They can choose whatever carrier best meets their needs um, and enables them to successfully grow across the web. And that'd be a great thing, not only for, for sellers, but ultimately for consumers. Thank you, Stacey. And then Ariana, if you had any more follow-ups, um, invite you to put that into the q and I want to bring uh, Jeff Bliss in to answer your question. Jeff? Unmute. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Jeff Bliss from the Capital Forum. Thanks so much. This is a general question, kind of following up on what Stacey said. Uh, a lot of things that you're, it seems that people are suggesting as remedies or, or behavioral in nature would require some type of massive monitoring by the government. Um, are any of you in favor of some type of partial breakup or like where, where Amazon can do one thing and not another, anything like that? Stacey, you want to go ahead and just pick that back up? Sure. I mean, that the lawsuit um, includes, you know, sort of says that the FTC is saying we're hoping the court will consider all remedies, including structural relief, which uh, alludes to the idea that um, the solution here may be to, to uh, split Amazon up into multiple companies. Here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we've been advocating for that for a long time. I really believe, having studied Amazon closely, that there is no real solution. Um, there is no other way to actually open up competition in the online market um, unless we, we split up Amazon. And I think that means this splitting Amazon into essentially four companies. Its retail division would become a, a standalone company similar in size to Target. Its marketplace uh, would become a neutral marketplace for sellers, not compromised by being connected to its retail operation. Its logistics would become a new competitor to UPS and the post office, uh, and then its cloud services division would be the fourth. Um, this is, you know, and, and I just want to say this is, you know, breaking up Amazon in this way. Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Um, restructuring Amazon in this way, it would not. Um, you know, it's not about breaking Amazon as a shopping option. Rather, it's actually saving Amazon from itself because now all of these 
the, the, the companies that, that have spun off from Amazon, these, these four spinoffs, would actually have to compete on the merits. And we would have real competition. And that would be terrific for businesses. And it would be also great for consumers. Because let's not forget, we have seen very little in the way of innovation and online commerce. And in fact, the experience of shopping on Amazon is really degraded. And then Nicholas, uh, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. I agree with Stacy. I think this should be broken up into four or five companies, depending on how you look at Amazon. Um, I think part of the problem is that for Amazon, they can't help but be loyal uh, to their own sales, to their first party sales. So if you look at logistics, um, they preference warehouse space. If you look at advertising, uh, they preference their own advertising, which isn't even a real cost to Amazon. So if you search a term like coffee or something like that, you're going to see a bunch of Amazon specific results. And what that does is it drives up the price of that search term for all the third party sellers. Um, so I just think that you have to break it up and uh, it would force Amazon to sell their items uh, in, in the way that third party sellers do, right? At, a, at kind of a normal amount of markup. They couldn't lose the tens of billions that they lose selling their own inventory. Uh, I think we would see FBA fees come down to a reasonable level. There are already a lot of other third party logistics firms out there that do similar type of work. So, uh, you know, I don't see that as being an impediment to sellers that don't fulfill their own orders. Uh, of course, advertising, as mentioned by Jason, that's become this massive business by itself where, um, you know, we don't, we don't really even know how much we should spend. And advertising budget just comes down to what can you afford, you know, what's the breaking point. Um, and then, of course, AWS, which is obviously a totally separate business and, and maybe even much more valuable than Amazon itself. So I, I think that that's the best solution. That would make me very happy. Thank you. Thanks. And then Jason, I know you wanted to get back in. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what um, Nicholas is saying there. It, just to pick up where we left off, AWS would be valued almost instantly as a trillion dollar company if it was broken apart. So I think, you know, certainly any company, especially a big company, doesn't want to be broken up. Right. So Amazon's going to say and do whatever they can to not be broken up. That being said, I think there's a lot of fear mongering that's happened where, um, you know, uh, some sellers have been frightened, uh, sometimes by Amazon, sometimes just uh, for fear of the government. I mean, let's be honest, the 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 opinion polls for Amazon are in the 80s and 90s. Government is in the teens or lower. Right. I mean, people just right now, when I talk to sellers, they don't really trust that the government is going to come in here and do the right thing or get anything done. I think this action shows something, tells a different story by the FTC because, you know, we've been waiting for something like this for a very long time. But um, I also think if the FTC is not successful in winning this case and not successful in breaking it up, my sort of my, my bare minimum hope here is that they could get some concessions from Amazon, this process of buy box suppression, where According to Amazon's own staff, if you sell your the exact same product um, on Target.com for a penny less than you do on Amazon, your listing on Amazon gets what what sellers commonly call buy box suppression. Amazon's own people say that you will lose forty percent of your regular revenue if you're buy box suppressed. If that, and I think I think that's one of the areas that um, the FTC has has named uh, this pricing competition thing, where they're suppressing or, or they're actually raising prices. That that change alone, if not just Amazon, if all retailers were not allowed to control the price of a brand, I think that would blast open the doors of competition. I have to say on the on the fulfillment side of things, um, I do think that more competition, if FBA had to stand alone, those costs would likely go up, but more competition would drive those costs down over time. So even if there isn't a breakup, I do think that the FTC's actions can gain some additional concessions. We're seeing some of them. Amazon opened seller fulfilled prime. You could do it from your own warehouse or series of warehouses right now. And they, and they cut a fee uh, associated with it. So I think, again, a lot of this has happened because of the great advocacy work from folks like Stacey Mitchell and others talking about and defending uh, small businesses. But also, I think there will be some concessions, even if there isn't a breakup. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. And 
Um, seeing no more questions at the moment, um, Stacy, I think I will have you say, oh, we got one, we got one. Uh, Marie, let me open this up for you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you so much. I hope that you can't see me. Um, <laughs> good. Um, does anybody know what Project Nessie is? And um, is there any thought about, you know, beyond breaking up Amazon, how we might regulate um, their, their conduct or their relationships with sellers to give sellers more um, of a due process and, and, and to just sort of, um, it's, it just seems like Amazon is this materialist tyrannical force with its own, um, uh, that to, to make it the seller's um, lives, maybe a seller's bill of rights. Is there any, is, is there any avenue for that? Um, I am, am writing for the American Prospect. Thank you, Maureen. I see Stacy, you came off mute. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just uh I just turn off his notifications. Apologies. Um yeah, I appreciate that question a lot. And I it's something I've thought about a lot. You certainly, I mean, we supported the um, big tech bills in Congress, you know, which included uh Klobuchar's self-preferencing bill, which you know had a number of provisions to prevent some of the most egregious behaviors that Amazon engages in. Um you know, however, I, I do find that it's hard to imagine a scenario in which we could establish the kind of regulatory system that would really be effective for, for a couple of reasons. Um, Amazon's, you know, conducts massive numbers of transactions. Um, you know, it's just huge. And a lot of it's very opaque uh, by algorithms. It's very difficult even for market participants to necessarily know when Amazon is putting its thumb on the scales and favoring its own interests, um, who is getting the buy box, uh, that in some cases, Amazon's interest is to put its own product there, but some cases it's not, it's to put another seller there where they're making a bigger fee. And so it's really hard to, to actually know and imagine how we could possibly monitor that effectively. Certainly it would require a lot, and, um, and I'm not sure at the end of the day would really would really solve the problem. Um, you know, that said, I definitely favor, uh, uh, you know, we've definitely pushed hard for the congressional uh, you know, measures uh, to restrict some of these terrible practices. And I do think that that starts to open up space where maybe you would begin to get real competition and competition ultimately could discipline some of Amazon's bad behavior and possibly there is a pathway. But I do really think that the cleanest and most productive pathway is uh, is to restructure the company. Um, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, I think that really is uh, the solution that would generate like the most kind of oxygen in the market that would really open things up in a way that would be hugely, um, hugely beneficial. I one other thing I'll just very quickly add on that is that I do think. Um, you know, there's a, there's an important role here for you know, uh, you know beefing up the post office, for example, as a com as an entity that can do e-commerce fulfillment or could do more e-commerce fulfillment for small sellers. There are ways in which, in addition to addressing Amazon's power, we can also use public policy to support and develop alternatives. Uh, Nicholas, uh, you had a thought you wanted to try maybe. Uh yeah, thanks. So real quick, I, I do think that sellers need some sort of collective bargaining uh, group, whether you call it a collective, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. Right now, Amazon is 100% autocratic and, you know, there's 2 million third party sellers and we have no voice in any, any decision. It just gets handed down. Sometimes we don't even get informed. Uh, but anyway, that, those, those are just my thoughts on it. Thank you. Perfect. And then Jason, I'll invite you in. We have a couple minutes left. And so um, if there's any final questions that want to come in uh, from the journalists, we've got a few minutes there. But then uh, Jason, yeah, I'll let you kind of uh, fill some time right now. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with Nicholas. Um, I think any brand who opts to sell on the Amazon platform signs a signs it has to sign. They're required to sign a very one-sided seller agreement. Part of that agreement is forced arbitration. Uh, that agreement 
prevents brands and sellers from putting together a class action lawsuit. Um, and and it, it really sort of shuts down the voices of sellers. So I think um, regulation can be a slippery slope. I have always kind of felt strongly that the courts are probably the best place to shake this out and to give brands uh, sort of a stronger voice, revamping and preventing the requirement of forced arbitration that can cost a brand $100,000, $200,000. It's really punitive cost in nature um, would, would really open up um, a dialogue, if you will, uh, between sellers and Amazon. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. And then um, with, with the closing minutes, I'm going to throw it back to Stacy and let her um, sort of wrap this thing up for us. That's great. Well, I just mainly want to thank everyone for, for being here. Um, we'll be continuing to dig through the lawsuit itself uh, and unearthing some of the, the details of what the, the, the evidence that the FTC has brought. Um, so stay tuned uh, for, for more on that front. And I also just want to say, and this is in some ways going back to Mo's question, is I do think that the filing of a lawsuit in and of itself, and we know this from history, uh, does tend to uh, put companies back on their heels a bit. And so uh, one of the, the great benefits of this having happened is it is going to make Amazon much more uh, cautious about what it does now. And indeed, as someone already mentioned, we saw it already has rolled back one of the new fees that it was attempting to impose on sellers. And so we're already seeing the effects of this case. And I think long term, um, this could be hugely beneficial to the American economy if it succeeds. And with that, thank you all. Uh, thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you everyone. And yes, thank you to all of our panelists. Truly appreciate your time and all the journalists for covering this important story. If you have any questions that come up between now and I mean, forever, but you know, next couple of days, uh, feel free to reach out. My email is reggie, R-E-G-G-I-E at ILSR.org. And we can get you in touch with any of the panelists here or perhaps uh, others that you might be interested in speaking to. So thank you so much. And uh, we will have, uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.